Institute and Alport Medical Center in Brown University. And uh, today he'll be joining us with his uh, lecture on um, the extracellular vesicles for the treatment of inoperable coronary disease, a future option or another degenerative failure. Professor Selke, I'm very pleased to have you here. Please feel free to uh, start your presentation. Well, thank you. Can you see my slides okay? I can see yes. them. Fine. Yes, we, we do. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for their uh, very uh, kind invitation to uh, present at your always outstanding meeting. Um, I, I really enjoyed the last uh, uh, presentation on the uh, uh, architecture and, and uh, land of Iran. I've been there many times and I've seen a lot of the country, but I see that there's many places I've yet to see. So uh, we have a new president now and hopefully the relationship with our countries uh, will be better so I can uh, return back to Iran. These are my disclosures. So I'm going to talk about extracellular vesicles. And uh, before I start with that, uh, we all know cardiovascular disease is a major uh, uh, problem in all of the Western world, or actually throughout the world. And it uh, causes the death of one in every four uh, persons in the world. And there's many risk factors and diabetes and obesity, especially in the United States and uh, uh, Western Europe, are increasing in their incidence and a contribution to the development of cardiovascular disease. So I think it's important that the, we continuously develop new therapies for this. Unfortunately, there's a lot of patients that can't have your traditional uh, treatment of cardiovascular disease, either medicines, uh, coronary bypass surgery, uh, valve operations, and uh, PCI, things like that. So regenerative therapies are indicated in cases in which uh, a patient can't have one of these traditional therapies. Um, and like I said, it's uh, generally reserved for patients uh, that can't have one of the traditional uh, treatments uh, for cardiovascular disease, and it's to improve heart function uh, with targeted or existing uh, cells or exogenous cells, normalized myocardial perfusion when patients can't have a PCI or coronary bypass surgery. But you also have to be aware that you have to maintain the uh, safety of these therapies. Uh, early uh, studies with the cell therapy uh, found that there was uh, tumor growth and a high incidence of arrhythmias. These are really the downside of some of these uh, regenerative therapies. Now, regenerative therapies uh, really involve uh, gene therapy, uh, growth factor therapy, uh, uh, cellular therapy, and these have virtually all been very effective in uh, preclinical animal experiments. Uh, they've increased perfusion at rest and with stress, they increased vascular density, uh, and increased uh, myocardial perfusion, uh, they increased uh, contractility in the heart, and they improve vascular uh, function. Usually the endothelial function becomes much more uh, normalized. So overall, the, the results in these preclinical experiments uh, in, in animal models have been very favorable. Unfor unfortunately, virtually all these uh, therapies have been negative when they've been applied to actual patients. So why is it? Why are these preclinical studies virtually all very positive yet virtually nothing works in patients. And interestingly, there seems to be a trend toward a benefit, but it's not really enough to provide a real uh, improvement in the care of these patients. Well, animal studies have involved generally healthy, young uh, animal models in which regional, regional uh, cardiac ischemia is induced. Patients, humans with, uh, these illnesses, either heart failure or um, uh, a lack of blood flow to the myocardium, the patients eligible for these range of therapies have altered cell, cell signaling because of diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, so that the animal models simply don't reflect what we're seeing in these patients. Now, we, uh, a long time ago, 17 years ago, uh, was interested in this. We uh, did a lot of uh, preclinical studies with some of these growth factors, uh, fibroblast growth factor two, or also known as basic fibroblast growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor in animal models. And they were virtually all very 
robustly positive in, in our pig model of regional ischemia. And we did a clinical trial, uh, which was published in circulation, uh, which showed very modest benefits. And there's been other uh, therapies or clinical trials using other growth factors, uh, which were negative. So why, why is this discrepancy? Well, we simply fed these pigs a high fat diet and induced regional myocardial ischemia with an, what's called an amyloid constrictor. You place this uh, constrictor on the circumflex artery. Now it's a, it's a plastic which is encased in a stainless steel or hard plastic ring. So it absorbs water and constricts inward as opposed to dilating outward. So you get a, a nice model of chronic ischemia. It's not an ischemic, a, acute ischemic model. So it very closely replicates what we're seeing as patients. So he goes, gave, gave this growth factor to both normal fed pigs and a pigs fed a high cholesterol diet, 4% high cholesterol diet. And we'll look at the results. Well, uh, we found that the, the pigs that got the normal diet had a very robust improvement in myocardial blood flow to this ischemic territory in the circumflex uh, region. Whereas when you simply fed these animals a high fat diet, it totally negated any beneficial effect of the FGF2 or other growth factors, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, for example. Uh, in fact, you actually, in the panel on the lower part of the slide, demonstrates you actually see a further reduction in myocardial fusion uh, with the administration of FGF2. Uh, now we will look at this further. Why should this be the case? Well, one reason is that uh, there's several anti-angenic factors uh, expressed in uh, animals that are given simply a, a high fat diet or induced diabetes with streptozosin. You can see the expression of angiostatin on the left and endostatin on the right, which as most of you know, are very potent anti-angenic factors, its expression is markedly increased in the setting of either type one or diet induced type two diabetes. So this is one reason uh, why, the, why the effect of these growth factors or cell therapy uh, for that matter uh, are totally negative. This is pretty much the same for uh, gene therapy uh, or cell therapy. Now we did this examination also in patients. We, uh, we took patients that uh, did not have diabetes and measured the expression uh, both in the myocardium and the serum of angiostatin and endostatin. In both cases, uh, patients that had diabetes had a marked increase in expression both in the serum and the myocardium and these anti-angenic factors suggesting that not only in animal models is this is the case, but also is evident in patients uh, that suffer from diabetes or hypercholesterolemia for that matter, uh, they have a diminished effect of uh, the response to both growth factors, gene therapy, and also cell therapy for that matter. Well, after the gene therapy and protein therapy trials essentially were negative, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on cell th therapy. Now, initially it was thought that these would differentiate into new cardiomyocytes and arterioles. Well, that theory was pretty much uh, debunked. Uh, they were then felt to have a trophic effect. And this actually is probably the case why they may provide some benefit, but of limited clinical utility in most cases. Uh, delivery may be a key limiting step. Um, you can inject them directly into the, to the myocardium, uh, but that requires a, a surgical operation. You can inject them directly into the coronary arteries, but often uh, they, they stay within the coronary arteries or just die there or go somewhere else. And because of, in part, the lack of efficacy and problems with the delivery trials have largely been negative. Extracellular vesicles are an interesting entity. Um, they were first discovered about uh, 30 uh, or 40 years ago, and they were uh, seemed to be coming from the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. And, you know, we, we all know that this is involved with the protein synthesis, but on electron microscopy, there were these vesicles within the cell, 
And they really were thought to be artifacts of the processing uh, for electron microscopy. Nobody really knew what, what they were doing. Uh, a couple of guys, James Rothman, uh, Tom uh, Sudhoff, and Randy uh, Sheckman, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2013 for uh, investigating these extracellular vesicles. Uh, it was found that they weren't just artifacts of the processing of the tissue, but they play a major role in intercellular trafficking of proteins, RNAs, and lipids. And they're involved with um, uh, not only transport of uh, intercellular materials and proteins, but have a dramatic effect on tissue healing in response to injury. Uh, they secrete paracrine factors. Uh, they can limit inflammation in some cases. In fact, some, some cases we actually uh, found that they increased inflammation. It really depends on the nature of these vesicles. They can reprogram immune cells, activate endogenous repair pathways, and their small size uh, allows them to traverse capillaries unlike certain stem cells like mesenchymal uh, uh, stem cells. So uh, they uh, contain uh, various uh, cargo, like I mentioned, cytokines, growth factors, signaling lipids, messenger RNAs, and regulatory inhibitory RNAs are some of the components that are cargo uh, that can uh, uh, lead to uh, uh, altered signaling, a repair process, and a lot of uh, roles that we really don't understand yet. Uh, and it wasn't until these uh, three gentlemen that won the Nobel Prize uh, came about that uh, allowed us to understand that they actually play a major physiological and clinical role in while the, how the mechanisms uh, may occur. We uh, take uh, mesenchymal stem cells and uh, grow them in a Petri dish. And one good thing about extracellular vesicles is that you can engineer them uh, easy, either with uh, uh, transduction methods or just changing the, uh, the culture uh, environment. Uh, we have been starving these uh, cells. We've been uh, adding various uh, drugs or changing the oxidative stress within the growth media. So, uh, these cells are, are, are fed every three to five days until they're mainly confluent, and then we salture, subculture them. And these particular experiments that I'm going to show, uh, they're stress in a uh, serum-free uh, RPMI uh, medium overnight, and then the microvesicles and exosomes uh, are harvested. The exosomes are just the very small uh, microvesicles. So we do a proteomic analysis. Uh, this is relatively simple to do, uh, which uh, can show the contents of the vesicles, especially the, the proteins. So if you do some intervention like starve them or change the, uh, the, the, the oxidative stress, you can very quickly determine what effect your intervention has on the composition of the extracellular vesicles. So here we, uh, we stressed them and found that they actually increased in size. And the previous size just shows the uh, proteomic analysis of the contents of these vesicles. So this is a whole nother area that we're getting, we and others are getting involved with to try to engineer the contents of these vesicles. Uh, we like to use a Yorkshire Yorkshire swine amyloid constrictor model. Again, the amyloid constrictor is a, a, a casein plastic contained within a uh, hard ring. So it can't uh, expand outward, has to constrict uh, inward. So it occludes the coronary artery over a period of about two weeks. So it's, a, it's a, not a model of infarction. Uh, it allows collateral vessels to grow during this two week period. So the muscle looks normal, but it's deprived of uh, myocardial perfusion. So we wait uh, two to three weeks uh, we document that the uh, circumflex artery is occluded, and then we inject the extracellular vesicles in the ischemic and the borderline territory. And then um, uh, at, uh, after this, uh, we reanalyze the, uh, the tissue, uh, measure blood flow, uh, signaling pathways, 
and um, look at uh, the vascular density to see if our intervention has uh, done anything. In this particular uh, set of experiments, uh, we had a control which uh, the, the uh, animals received a saline injection, intermyocardial injection of extracellular vesicles, and intravenous in injection of the extracellular vesicles because one of our colleagues uh, who is a specialist in this assured us that these vesicles will know where to go. Uh, and this may be evident in small rodent models, uh, but we're a little suspicious that this was actually be uh, the case in a, a large animal model. So this is one of the uh, groups that we investigated. So not to our surprise, uh, in the ischemic uh, left ventricular myocardium, uh, we found an increased uh, collateral dependent perfusion uh, in, with, with the injection of the uh, extracellular vesicles. In the normal territory, that's the myocardium supplied by the left anterior ascending artery, there was no uh, improvement. And if you look at the uh, perfusion, the ischemic left ventricle, the circumflex artery territory over the normal ventricle, again, there was a significant improvement in the perfusion. So uh, we thought, well, um, we may be onto something here, but we found the same thing with virtually any therapy that we, we perform, whether it's growth therapy, uh, cell therapy, and others also have demonstrated this in otherwise young, normal animals. So this is really not surprising, but it was a good first step. We looked at the increased vascular density, uh, both the capillaries uh, density with a CD31 stating and smooth muscle actin, and the merged uh, CD31 smooth muscle actin uh, uh, to ascertain whether the arteriolar density, the larger vessel density was improved as well. Um, again, uh, we saw a significant increase in capillary density and arteriolar density in those animals that had the injection of the extracellular vesicles much better than those that had the injection of the saline uh, placebo. Now, we were also interested in to see if the hemodynamics would be improved. So we did uh, pressure volume loop measurements with a Mylar catheter. And uh, again, there was an improvement in myocardial function. Uh, in function. Uh, the cardiac output was improved. The stroke volume was significantly improved, uh, whereas the heart rate and mean arterial pressure was not different. different. So, uh, not only is vascular density in myocardial perfusion, uh, uh, perfusion improved, but also function uh, seems to be uh, uh, elevated. Now we'll look at some of the signaling pathways uh, that may be evident. Uh, uh, DLL4, uh, uh, delta-like uh, protein 4, is a regulatory development uh, protein, uh, which is interest in instrumental in uh, early uh, cardiac development. It's actually a negative factor. So if you can reduce the expression, you're going to release the potential of the tissue to, to grow and have uh, increased uh, uh, perfusion through angiogenesis. So you can see on the upper left uh, panel, the expression of DL delta-like uh, protein 4 is markedly reduced, which gives one uh, bit of evidence how the, the injection of these vesicles may in, improve uh, perfusion and function. But there are so many proteins that are altered. Um, on the uh, lower middle panel, GATA6 uh, is involved with hypertrophy. You'd think that this would be increased uh, because more hypertrophy and growth of the myocardium and the myocytes you'd think would increase function, yet it was markedly reduced. So a lot of things that we don't clearly understand. And the lower right panel shows the uh, expression of IL-6 inflammatory cytokine, that is also increased. Whereas other uh, groups have uh, demonstrate in many cases that the injection of external vesicles actually reduces inflammation. So um, there's a lot of variability in the effects. When you giving any regenerative potential therapy, whether it's growth factors or gene therapy or cell therapy, you have to be concerned about scarring. So we're looking at collagen. We found that the injection of the extra vesicles really had no effect on a scar formation in the, in the ventricle. So 
In summary, in these preliminary experiments, uh, we found that the expression of DLL4, a potential negative antigenic factor was diminished, increasing the potential of the myocardium to grow new blood vessels. Now, this is one of probably 100 proteins um, that uh, need to be investigated. And we started to do that, but this is just one example of a protein uh, that may be changed with the injection of these vesicles. Now, getting back to the uh, potential of the intravenous injection causing an improved perfusion and function, uh, we found not to our surprise that there was actually no benefit. Now, these were similar amounts of extracellular vesicles as we injected directly into the heart. Uh, these were injected intravenously and we actually found no benefit as you can see uh, both uh, at rest and with pacing. That's the, uh, the group of uh, points uh, to the right, uh, MVI. So it's good that we did these other experiments while injecting them directly in the heart. Uh, to demonstrate that they actually may have the potential improved uh, function and perfusion. This has actually also been reported by others comparing the direct myocardial injection and the intravenous injection of the uh, extra vesicles. Um, so this may have some implications on the clinical uh, ramifications. So the vesicles uh, when injected increase angiogenesis, they have a minimal effect on fibrosis. Certainly the intramyocardial injection is superior to the intravenous injection. And we're still trying to figure out which cytokines, growth factors, signaling lipids, uh, messenger RNAs, and other uh, factors are responsible for this effect. Now in the past, we've also, we've always gone to a uh, more clinically relevant uh, model of, of disease, uh, simply as feeding the animals a high fat diet for a month or so. So this is the next uh, set of experiments uh, where we took 31 uh, male uh, Yorkshire pigs, uh, fed them either, either a normal diet or a high fat diet. Uh, we placed the amaray constrictor and then three weeks later, uh, either gave them uh, the uh, injection of the extra vesicles or the vehicle. And then uh, five or eight weeks later, the animals uh, were sacrificed. And we did the same, uh, examination of myocardial perfusion, uh, function, vascular density, cell signaling, and gene expression. Now, we also uh, had a group in which we gave a calpain inhibitor. Now, these are a whole nother series uh, of experiments that we've done. Calpain is an inflammatory protein enzyme, and it's an uh, increase in diabetes, uh, heart failure, and, and myocardial ischemia. And we found that if you can inhibit calpain moderately, you get a marked improvement in myocardial perfusion, vascular density, and also uh, a kind of a borderline effect in myocardial function. So we figured we saw a benefit of calpain inhibition, um, also an, a beneficial effect on the uh, intramyocardial injection of the extracellular vesicles. If you combine these, maybe you'll get a very robust uh, response. Well, we found that there's really no benefit uh, in the um, uh, non-ischemic uh, myocardium. But in the ischemic ventricle uh, with pacing, we saw once again in this high fat model of uh, chronic myocardial ischemia, uh, we saw a very robust increase in, in myocardial perfusion just with the injection of the extracellular vesicles. And we have not found this with other therapies uh, such as protein uh, growth factors. Yet to our surprise, uh, when you combine the injection of the extra vesicles with the moderate calpain inhibition, it totally negated any beneficial effect. So, uh, you know, sometimes your hypothesis doesn't uh, pan out and this is one of those cases. So the extra vesicles by themselves or the inhibition of calpain markedly improves myocardial infusion, but the combination uh, negates any beneficial effect. And you saw this um, also in the non-ischemic uh, ventricular uh, myocardium, uh, interestingly. Well, if you look at vascular density, we see pretty much the same th uh, thing. You see uh, the uh, arterial density is markedly increased uh, with the extra vesicles in this high fat fed uh, 
model of um, chronic ischemia. And uh, once again, the combination of the vesicles plus the calipine inhibition didn't show any beneficial effect. Um, so we're also uh, interested in looking at some of the mechanisms involved here. So we did uh, gene expression uh, studies. This is uh, recently accepted in the Journal of the American Heart Association. It's really beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but looking at some of the mechanisms, why these different therapies, in particular, the injection of extra vesicles may be beneficial or and what their various interventions on these vesicles will have uh, before we inject them into the heart. And this slide just shows the relative gene expression and pathways for all the different uh, combinations, the, the normal diet control, high fat diet control. There's actually a very differential effect on gene expression just with feeding these animals a high fat diet. Uh, looking at normal diet, extracellular a vesicle injection group versus a normal diet control. What is the effect of the vesicles in the normal diet situation? That's the upper panel on the right. What does the injection of the extra vesicles have on the uh, gene expression in the high fat diet? That's the panel, lower left panel. And um, the effects of the diet in the two groups that have both received the injection of extra vesicles. That's the panel on the uh, lower right corner. So we're, we've analyzed these, but again, this is, uh, it's good for looking at the mechanism and uh, you should be able to, to read this paper within the next uh, couple of days, but it just uh, shows the market uh, uh, effects that both diet and the injection of these vesicles has on gene expression. So in summary, with regard to medical uh, metabolic parameters, I actually didn't show this, but a high fat diet, uh, they present with hyperglycemia, hypercholesterolemia, really a lot of the uh, markers for metabolic syndrome. And interestingly, the injection of the extra vesicles reduce the hypercholesterolemia, uh, LDL levels and traminases. So it may actually have a, a, a beneficial effect there. In addition, by itself reducing cholesterol level, which is kind of a surprise for us. Uh, the cardiac function hemodynamics, uh, a high fat diet by itself actually improved myocardial function. Since the uh, myocardial energy substrate is mainly free fatty acids, uh, this is really not surprising. We of others have shown this in the past. But interestingly, if uh, you subject the uh, animal to a myocardial infarction, it, in the high fat diet situation, the infarct size is actually considerably greater as is apoptosis. So extra vesicles improve myocardial systolic function, diastolic function, and looking at uh, perfusion, uh, the high fat diet did not um, affect perfusion to the same extent that it did in the normal uh, diet animals, but there was a beneficial effect, but you certainly saw increase in arterial or density. And uh, looking at the protein expression, the high fat diet uh, caused a, a deficient in the, the VEGF uh, R2 receptor, uh, uh, the phosphorylated form, my, my, my mitogen uh, uh, activated protein kinase, but did cause an upregulation of phosphorylated form of endothelial NOS and PFOX, which are certainly uh, instrumental in increasing uh, blood vessel growth. With regard to gene expression, it, it uh, had contrasting global pattern of gene expression between diets, showing that just the diet can have a dramatic effect on gene expression. And there was a differential uh, expression of the genes in the high fat diet between those that got extra vesicles and the control uh, enriching the pathways immunity. So why should extra vesicles be the solution when, when growth factors, gene therapy, and cell therapy have largely not been affected? Well, they came men, contain many potentially angenic and myogenic substances. They're able to transmigrate through the uh, myocardial capillaries, making delivery uh, much more uh, potentially effective. They're easy to delivery. They essentially can be taken off the shelf 
uh, you could take blood or, or bone marrow and uh, engineer these. Um, they are immunogenic, but not functionally because they release their content so quickly, probably within seconds to minutes. So immunogenic uh, factors really don't play a major role. And again, they can be prepared in advance of surgery or PCI. Uh, so it's much more convenient to deliver uh, vesicles than it would be uh, some of these other therapies. And we currently are using a high fat uh, fed amyloid model to more closely replicate what we're seeing in patients, but we certainly need to better understand the science. Some of the problems right now, they're difficult to mass produce. There's a lot of variability in the quality. Uh, previous trials using growth factors, gene therapy and cell therapy have failed. This just may be another regenerative therapy that fails, but because we can manipulate the extracellular vesicles so much, uh, we're hopeful that we can come up with the right combination of cargo in the vesicles to provide excellent benefit. Now, we have shown some benefit in our high fat fed um, uh, pigs. So that again, gives us some uh, reason for optimization and, and um, um, feeling that they may have a benefit. But mother nature has set up many inhibitory pathways. Otherwise, uh, some of these growth factor pathways would lead to blindness, uh, uh, kidney failure. So uh, these inhibitory factors and pathways are set up to reverse, to put the, put the brakes on these pro-angenic pathways. Otherwise, uh, we uh, probably wouldn't live very long. And unfortunately, some of these inhibitory pathways mirror interfere with all regenerative methods. So we are um, optimistic that extracellular vesicles um, may provide some benefit. But again, I've been working on this for over 20 years now, and uh, we still haven't met with success. But I am op optimistic that uh, the use of these vesicles will provide some benefit to the patients. They certainly have been used in all uh, areas of uh, stroke uh, research, uh, 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 cancer therapy. So there's tremendous uh, potential these. And so I, again, I'm very optimistic. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. If we have any time, I'd be glad to answer some questions, but I think we're running, running a little behind. Uh, this is my team and thank you for, very much for your attention.